are continuing this morning with our Mind Field message series, and it's based off of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And what we've been talking about for the last several weeks is um, different uh, topics that really um, affect our mind and how we understand things, that make our mind a little less than sound the way that God has uh, created us to be. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a topic in a word and a phrase that maybe you've never even really heard of before, but I think you're going to see it affects every aspect of life. This morning, I want to talk to you about something called emotional reasoning, or maybe you've heard it uh, as emotional truth. And what emotional reasoning is, is is when someone believes that their emotional reaction to something proves something to be true or false. So that's even when uh, in light of empirical evidence, even in light of facts stating contrary, when we experience an emotional reaction to something, we will believe our emotional experience to be true, even if facts teach us that, in fact, that isn't how it really is. Um, you know, the more emotional that we are, the more that our, our perception of reality can be skewed by our emotions. Um, I hear all the time when I talk to people, well, I, I just feel like, and that's great that you feel like something, but just because we feel like something, it doesn't make it true. There's a room for emotion, you know, to have that emotional feeling. In fact, there's a word for it that's helpful. It's called intuition, right? When we have a feeling that something's a certain way, even though we might not know it to be true, that feeling, you know, kind of gives us a little extra insight. That's good, but too much emotion's a a bad thing, you know, like water, like caffeine, like anything. Uh, The right amount of it's good, but too much of it can be deadly, Um, and, you know, obviously too much of it is, uh, it's just not good at all. Now, For all of you who have out of emotion said something that you wish you hadn't, for all of you who out of emotion have believed something to be true that has blown up on you because it really wasn't, this message is for you. And I think all of us, one way or the other, have, have, have done that before. But once again, we, there's a spectrum of, of those of us in here who aren't really emotional and some people who are highly emotional. And the more emotional that you are, the more that, that your version and vision of reality is liable to be skewed by your own emotions. Now, with all of these topics, if we can't base them on the Bible, then there's no reason talking about them in in church. So uh, this morning, we're going to kind of look at the biblical basis for this concept of our emotions skewing our perception of reality. And we're going to start by looking at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. And it says, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. So what the Proverbs are doing is it's, it's, it's con- you know, contrasting um, basically those who trust in themselves within and those who, who, who believe in and, and walk in wisdom, that those are to some extent opposite one another. Who are those who trust in themselves? Well, that's, that's when we're just kind of going off our gut, off maybe our natural knowledge, going off of our feelings. And when we do that, Proverbs says, you're a fool. But where do we get wisdom from? Because wisdom is where we're kept safe. Well, ultimately, we get wisdom from God's word. There is no place that you can get more wisdom than ultimately reading God's word. Now, why are we not just like reading it on a daily basis if that's a source of wisdom? I, I don't know. We, we, we just don't. Life lessons gives us wisdom. And honestly, listening to others who have wisdom, we can gain wisdom from them. So uh, for those who operate according to wisdom, they're kept safe. But those who trust in themselves, their own emotions, their own feelings, in the end, ultimately, they're fools. Now, when we look at the Bible, there's lots of different stories in the Bible in which we can see that people's vision and version and understanding of reality has been skewed by their emotions. Let's just start with Abraham. I I love Abraham for many different reasons, but it's an interesting story with Abraham. Abraham is called by God when he's an old man. Um, He's called to a land that he's never been to, and God promises him that when he gets there, there's going to be a land for him. 
God promises them, even though he and his wife are past childbearing age, that they're going to have as many descendants as stars in the sky. So Abraham believes God and trusts God, and God leads them to the land that, that he's to inherit. Now, when he gets there, there ends up being, a short time later, a famine in that land, and he's got to leave it. And when he leaves that land, he goes to Egypt, and as he heads to Egypt, um, he allows the emotion of fear to cause him to make a, a poor decision. And he actually does this twice, once in Egypt and once later um, in, in another place. He ends up lying about who his wife is because he's scared that he's going to be killed because people are going to want to get at his wife. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, 10 to 13. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was so severe. Now as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know that you're a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say that you're my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Now, because Abraham's looking through the emotion of fear, he'd rather someone else take his wife to be their wife than potentially die because like, they know that he's married to her. Now, how is it that this person who trusted God and believed in God, that God would give him this land, that he'd promise him descendants and all this other stuff, that God somehow needed his help to keep himself safe when he was in Egypt? Why? Because he's not looking at things the way that they really are. He's looking through the emotion of fear, and emotions skew our perception of reality. Think about the story of Jacob in the, in the Bible and in the Old Testament. Jacob has 13 children. Now, 11 of them are insanely jealous of Joseph. And so, because of their jealousy, it, it allows them to see a situation that, that doesn't exist. They see Joseph as a threat when Joseph wasn't a threat. So what they decide to do is 11 of them get together, they beat their brother up, they throw him into a well, uh, they sell him to some traders that are going to Egypt, and they go back and tell dad, man, he was attacked by a wild animal and he's dead. What causes 11 brothers to do that? Well, they're looking at the situation, not as it really was, but they're looking through the emotion of jealousy. Third example, and we see this all throughout scripture, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of it, but I, I, I think Saul is a good example of this in scripture. This isn't the Saul of the New Testament that becomes Paul. This is Saul, the first king of Israel in the Old Testament. The first king in the Old Testament, he was, a, he was kind of jealous. And he was, in fact, very jealous of, of David. And he had anger issues. And so what we see in Saul is because of his jealousy for David, he wants to kill David. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 10. So Saul threw his spear at David, and he tried to pin him to the wall. David jumped out of the way of the spear so that it missed him and it stuck into the wall. And that night, David runs away. Now here's the deal. Saul is jealous of David because people love David. And Saul thinks that David's going to try to wrestle the kingdom away. Nothing could be further from the truth. D David is extremely loyal to Saul. David has plenty of opportunities to kill Saul, to work against him. But Saul is the Lord's anointed. Saul is the king of Israel. So the reality is, is he couldn't have found a more a loyal person than what he had in David, but when he was looking at David through his emotions, he, he, he saw David incorrectly. Not only that, but Saul's wanting to kill his own son for the very same reason. Look at 1 Samuel 20, 27 through 33. So then Saul said to his son Jonathan, now Jonathan and David were best friends, okay? So Saul says to his son, Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse, that's David, come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me go away and see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the king's table. Now Saul's anger 
anger flared up against his son, Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear, uh, spear at his son to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Boy, some of you thought your dads had anger issues, huh? I mean, he's throwing a spear at his son to kill his son because his son's friends with David, who out of his own jealousy and anger, he wants dead as well. None of this stuff is true. None of it is accurate. But once again, emotions skew um, how it is that we perceive in what reality ultimately is. Now, that's the biblical basis for what we're talking about, this emotional reasoning, this emotional truth, and why, why it's not good and why it's not healthy, why it doesn't lead to a sound mind. Now, let's understand it as we go through life. First of all, let's understand things in terms of a, a spiritual perspective. Spiritually speaking, feelings can deceive us. Um, I'm going to share with you maybe something that, that many of you don't know, but uh, the Mormons, one of the sources in which they know that something is true or not true is that they say that there's a burning in their bosom. There's this feeling that they get, and based upon the feeling that they get, they can determine what's true or not true, what's not true. I'm going to show you a video clip of a, a leader in the Mormon church that is explaining what this burning in the bosom is all about. I have concern about the Mormons with a burning in the bosom. I think if you read the Book of Mormon, you get a burning in the bosom, that might be right, and, it, and it's true. If you don't get a burning in the bosom, it's false. So it says in DNC 8, you must study it out in your mind. If it be right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that you shall feel that it is right. We need to be really careful with the word burn in this verse because it seems to be specific to the context with Oliver Cowdery with his gift of translation while serving as a scribe for Joseph Smith. So sometimes LDS members have told people to take the Moroni prayer challenge, which is Moroni 10, 3 through 5, and by doing so, the person is going to feel some type of burning in their bosom, which I would bet the majority of members have never felt themselves. And as Boyd K. Packer said, he said, it's more like a warm light shining within your being. Dallin H. Oaks stated, I've met persons who told me that they've never had a witness from the Holy Ghost because they never felt the, bur the bosom burn within them. Does it need to be a feeling of caloric heat, like the burning produced by combustion? If that is the meaning, I've never had that burning in the bosom. The word burning in this scripture signifies a feeling of comfort and serenity. And that's the way revelation works, end quote. You see, peace seems to apply to all of us as far as recognizing the Lord's approval of a course of action that we've determined to take, just as in DNC 623 where it states, did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? So for a Mormon, feeling communicates truth. A feeling of, of serenity, of peace, um, equals that, that it must be true. So not only do you have the Bible, which gives truth, not only do they have the Book of Mormon that gives truth, but, but church teaching doctrine can come from just this, this feeling that comes inside that gives truth. But the problem is, is feelings can easily deceive us. Did you know that Mormons believe that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri? in the United States? It's serious. They do. That's their official teaching. Now, what did I say? I said emotional truth and emotional reasoning can stand in opposition to facts and in opposition to truth. And so even though in the Bible we know that rivers are named like the Tigris and the Euphrates in description to the, the Garden of Eden, that doesn't matter. It feels inside to be right to them. So the, the Garden of Eden certainly must have been in Missouri. 
According to Mormon teaching, Jesus and Satan were brothers. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say it, but, you know, someone thought of it, and, and, and that feeling seemed true, and it seemed right, so that's a part of their official teaching. They believe that, that God is just one amongst many gods, that this solar system in which we live, or, or maybe even just this, this galaxy in which we live, that there's a God over it, but every galaxy might have their own God, that's just God is a God amongst many gods and so forth. Now, where do they get that from? That's not from the Bible, but it's a thought that was come up, and, and, and the truth and the feeling inside them confirms it. You take even the Book of Mormon, do you realize where the Book of Mormon comes from? So Joseph Smith apparently uh, had this angel that came and gave him the, the, this manuscript, these tablets, in which he couldn't read. He was given these special glasses which allowed him to translate these, these uh, ancient Egyptian texts and put them into English, which becomes the Book of Mormon. Now, mind you, there's not any record of any of these tablets ever existing. The funny thing is, is like we have copies of the scripture that go back, you know, thousands of years that some copies of them go back within maybe 20 years of original writing. But for something that happened in the mid to late 1800s, we have no record of not even a scrap of not even a piece of you see logic and reason says that doesn't make sense. But yet it, when you operate according to motion, when you're operating according to the, bo you know, the burning in your bosom, then, you know, it's just true because it feels right. It's very dangerous. And you know, in a not too different way, even in, in Christianity today, mainstream Christianity, um, it, it, there's an equal um, danger in terms of, uh, of feeling and emotion. When you look at the, the, the more charismatic and Pentecostals amongst the Christians, they're constantly feeling like they're hearing from God. Now, how is it that they oftentimes feel like they're hearing from God? Because this goes on on a daily basis sometimes. It's always, almost always, through their thoughts and through their feelings that God is communicating to him that way. And, you know, I, as I was thinking about the message this week, and, and I've been literally thinking on this all week, and I've now preached this for two services, and I haven't had one person come up and give me an example. But I thought to myself this week, where, where in all of Scripture, Old Testament or New, does God communicate through thoughts and feelings? I, there might be one or two, but I'm still, I can't come up with any, and I can't think of any. How does God communicate in the Bible, which is a record of how he does communicate? He communicates through a burning bush. It's hard to confuse that one. He communicates through a donkey talking. It's hard to mess that one up either. They just don't, do they? He communicates through the angel of the Lord coming to speak or a different angel speaking. He communicates through his word. He communicates through his prophets. He communicates through all these different means. But I don't really recall any time in scripture where he's communicating through thoughts or, or feelings. Why? Because how would you know he's communicating? Because feelings are so evilly deceived. Once again, if it's a bush talking, it just doesn't happen. If it's a donkey talking, it doesn't happen. And angels talking, it just doesn't happen. But in modern Christianity, people are hearing from God on a daily basis through thoughts and feelings. And it's not that he can't. I'm not saying that he can't, but it doesn't appear he has. And if he has, I'm not thinking of it yet. And so we got to be careful. We got to be very careful because honestly, like Satan can appear as an angel of light to, to be able to confuse your thoughts and to confuse your feelings. That's so easy for Satan to do. I remember a couple years ago, someone was sitting right over here and as soon as after church was over and this person came from a Pentecostal church and she comes up to me and just said, God, I, I want you to know, God told me to tell you, you know, he wants you to do communion differently. I think I said, that's great that you had that thought. That God wasn't telling you to tell me to do communion differently. You thought, hey, if I was a pastor, this is how I would do it, and thus saith the Lord. 
I remember when I was um, just about to leave seminary and to take my first call as a pastor, um, I had uh, I had this middle-aged guy at this church that I'd done my field work at and so forth. He comes and he grabs me by the shoulder and he's like, you know, uh, you know, I've got a message from the Lord for you and, and you know, you need to know it's not going to be real easy these first few years and it's going to be really difficult, but, you know, just be faithful and after that, this is... There is nothing in which he told me that ever even came true. Why? Once again, because he just like, he just had a thought. He just had a feeling and he's thinking that that's God talking to him. Listen, can God talk through thoughts and feelings? He can, but how would you know it's him? It's a very dangerous and slippery slope. God does talk. I totally believe he does. But just because you got a burning in your bosom doesn't mean it's from God. What about, what about life? You know, if our theology can be distorted by feelings, how about our life? How about relationships? How about just, you know, as we go through life, how susceptible is that to be really distorted and messed up our reality by our feelings? How many of us in here have had a spouse or a, ch a child that like has been really messed up? Like m maybe addicted to drugs or addicted to alcohol, um, you know, just, just really just messed up. And from the feeling of love, from the fear feeling of compassion, what we end up doing is because we, we want to protect them, we, we shelter them, we, we try to make excuses for them, uh, you know, we try to keep them from maybe hitting rock bottom, all because we love them and we just care about them and we don't want to see, you know, we're afraid of what's going to happen if we don't, like, somehow cover for them. So because of the feeling of love, because of the, the, the feeling of compassion, what we actually do is we end up keeping them in their dysfunction. We keep them wallowing in their sin because somehow we care about them when nothing could be worse for them. But that's our version of reality because we care for them, a feeling. Oftentimes I'll counsel people and do counseling when people have been in a prior marriage, and this happens all the time. So in a prior marriage, you were married to someone who was an alcoholic. And, and that person, you know, just would make a fool out of themselves or, you know, drink a case of beer or drink a bottle of whiskey a day or whatever. And, 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 you know, the marriage ends up falling apart and you get remarried. And now I'm dealing in marriage counseling because in marriage counseling, you know, what gets brought up. And one of the problems is, is the person's complaining that whenever they crack open a beer, like the spouse will freak out. The spouse will accuse them of being an alcoholic, even though they may only drink, you know, a, a beer or, or two, you know, at a time. They, they never drink more than that. But every time the sound of that can opens, what's happening is a person who used to be in a relationship um, with a true alcoholic is taking all of those what feelings and understanding the reality of the present as being what was going on over there when nothing's further from the truth. And it can be very destructive to relationships. How are your feelings towards a boss causing you to understand the reality of your job? How are your feelings towards a past pastor or a past church or a past place that you're at and the members were all gossipy? How are you allowing that to affect how you understand God in the church today? How are you allowing feelings of disappointment about your past to see your hope uh, for the today and for the future? How are you allowing your love and care and compassion for your kids to, to, uh, to, to interact with your kids in such a way that so oftentimes, just because we love our kids so much because we don't want to see them hurt, we become helicopter parents and we try to protect them from this and we try to protect them for that. In the end, we end up smothering them and end up making it much worse than what it otherwise be. And we do it all because of of a, of a feeling of love. What I need everyone in here to see is that when we allow feelings to affect our perception of reality, it can have a destructive effect on relationships. It can have a destructive effect on our work. 
It can have a destructive effect on our finances. And it can also have a destructive effect on our spiritual walk with God. I hope I've made the case that feelings have the ability to dis distort reality. We've seen it in the Bible. We see it in religion. And hopefully you're able to see it in your own life. Now I want you to see it in the world. Because the reality is, is this world is screwed up. But why? Because we're perceiving the world through emotions, and those emotions are skewing our reality of truth. So let me walk you through some of the most controversial topics of the day and help you to understand them the way that they really are and that they're that way because we're seeing them through emotion. Let's start with critical race theory. Critical race theory is this, this concept that um, the world is fundamentally racist, that the world fundamentally favors especially white people, that it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's disadvantaging of, of, of all other races other than white, especially um, African Americans. Where does this thought come from in this day and age in which, like five years ago, we had a black president for eight years? Seriously. Where does this thought come from when there's many African-American uh, mayors and, and governors and police chiefs? We've seen them through Texas here uh, regularly. How is this even believed to be true? Well, it's believed to be true because there's strong emotion that is allowing us to believe it to be true, even though it's not. Uh, for people who, who've had been disadvantaged, in, had previous generations, ancestors disadvantaged by the systems that were in place at those times, there are strong feelings of resentment that color the way that they see truth. And even amongst white people, there's, there's, among some of them, a strong feeling of guilt about what their ancestors have done. So when you got resentment by one group of people and guilt by another, like we formulate this thing that just doesn't even make sense in today's world. In fact, there was a Newsweek poll of just two months ago. Do you know that only one third of Americans actually believe in this stuff? Two-thirds of Americans think it's horrible. But yet it's being taught in our high schools and it's being taught in our universities and it's being promoted in the media and it's being promoted in your workplaces. Why? Because they're all looking at it through emotions and emotions skew reality. And its attempt was to somehow make right or wrong, but all it's really done is it's brought racism back to the forefront where people are seeing people for their color of their skin. And I have to be honest with you, until five years ago, I would say my kids' generation didn't really understand or know what racism is. I'm not saying that there's not ever pockets of it somewhere, but as a whole, people didn't see people for the color of the skin. But now that's all that we're seeing. You know, it was, it was to somehow help a dis disadvantaged group, but in the end, what it does is it makes excuses for them, just like I talked about, like, enabling people and out of love, trying to do stuff that keeps them there. It, it, it makes excuses for why people are at a place and gives them no reason to move up and move on from it. That's why many people, even in the African-American community, are, are violently opposed to it. It's just, it's not truth and it's not reality, but when we look at it through emotions, it sure can seem like it closely connected to it is this whole defund the police movement. What emotion is associated with defund the police movement? Anger. And it's anger that is, is fanned by the media because they will take certain situations which are not the norm, that are the exception, and they will over amplify and build up anger and resentment and, and hatred and all these other things. But it's not reflective of what reality is. 
And as a result, there's been many cities in our country that have begun the process of defunding the police. Austin here in Texas, New York City, Chicago, um, LA, Portland, whatever. But inevitably, in all these cities that have removed money from the police force, all of a sudden, like, crime's going through the roof. Go figure. Why? Because they're doing something out of emotion rather than out of reality. Let me share with you what reality is. Do you know that in the last 10 years, 1,760 police officers have been killed in the line of duty? Almost 200 police officers every year are killed as they do their jobs. When's the last time you've really seen a news article or a news piece on it? You don't hear about it. But at least what, every other day that works out to be? Every other day, you don't hear a thing about it. The Washington Post has created a database on every known deadly police shooting since in America since 2015, so in the last six and a half years. Do you know that of every deadly police shooting in the last six and a half years, only 6% of them was the person not armed? 94% of the time, when there's a police shooting, uh, the person that got shot is armed. Listen, there, there's going to be like situations in which they have to decide in a split second, and maybe they see something they didn't. They can make mistakes. And you know what? Are there bad police officers? Absolutely. Are there bad pastors? You better believe it. Are there bad doctors? Absolutely. So you would expect a 6% number of, uh, to potentially be in there. But of those police shootings, this is the storyline you've never heard. Do you know that 46% of all people that have been shot by the police and killed in the last six and a half years, 46% of them have been white? Do you know that 32% have been neither white nor black? And that 24% of the people that have been killed in the last uh, six and a half years have been black. Now, the only thing that you'll hear on the news is when a, you know, a police officer kills an unarmed black person. How often does that happen when only 6% are unarmed and only 24% of them are black? When 42% are white, when 34% are something other than white or black. But that's not the storyline you hear. And it doesn't matter. Why? Because we're looking at it through emotion. The, 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 fa the, the flames of anger being fanned by the media, but it's not reflective of what truth is. That's what emotional truth and emotion emotional rationalization is, is even though empirical evidence says this it's not what we believe let's consider covid for a little bit you know the, the, the fear of COVID, you know what is it what's the emotion that governs covid well it's fear it's fear of death even though i've mentioned many times before it's like the fifth leading cause of death in the world three times a chance of having a, a heart attack or stroke. But everything's, you know, around this, and there's this big push, you know, everyone needs to get vaccinated, and if you're not vaccinated, you're evil. Even though the, the, the current vaccine is minimally effective to the, the current variants that are out there, in places like Israel, they've said 30-some percent, and I've seen it as low as 40, you know, percent even here in the United States to, to the, the most common and most up-to-date variants. But yet there's just this push that you have to do it, and if you don't, you're, you're evil. But is that what truth and reality is? I, well, look at a couple tweets th that I, I was sent yesterday. So this Mark Levine is the, the um, he's on the city council in New York City, uh, the seventh district, I think. And this is what he says. He says, New York City's new vaccination screening program for indoor dining requires that you show proof of, proof of vaccine and ID. If you don't have an ID, uh, don't forget to bring it. So in New York City, in LA, and these other places, you, if you're not vaccinated, you no longer have the right to eat indoors or to go to venues that are, you know, entertainment venues that are indoors, movies, concerts, whatever, different things like that, because you are a danger to society. Okay, let's go to the next uh, tweet that he has there. The ID requirement is to help reduce fraud. Now, this is someone in New York City that's concerned that people are going to lie about whether they're vaccinated. Now, how is that different than the debate that's been going on for years in terms of being able to vote? Like somehow voting isn't suspect to fraud, but your vaccination is? 
In fact, here's a tweet from the same guy a couple years earlier. Where do we get these inconsistencies that fraud can happen on vaccine and, and that if you're not vaccinated, you, you know, you're, you're killing people, even though the vaccine nowadays isn't really effective to the variants that are out there, you know, how, and, and that people can double talk like this and no one calls them out on it. It should stink to high heaven. But the reason we don't and the reason it ultimately doesn't bother us is because of fear causes us to see reality different than what it really is. How about cancel culture? What's cancel culture? It's this desire that anything that is is what used to be of Judeo-Christian values, that, that it's bad and it, it needs to change. What, what is the emotion that causes cancel culture? It, it's hatred. It's hatred for God as people want to be the kingdom, people want to be the power, people want to be the authority forever and ever. They don't want there to be a God. They don't, they don't want there to be a truth that's based upon God. And so anything that reflects that Judeo-Christian value is to be undone. That's why many of you who work for major corporations have to sit through those six hours of training in which you're brainwashed to rethink how you understand the world, how you re-understand what's right and what's wrong, what you can say, what's acceptable and what's not. It's because there's just this big emphasis to undo what's always been. And you've got social media and you've got companies that are aligning themselves with this. You know, with just the past week or two, I've been trying to find certain articles on Google and this was news to me, call me naive. I didn't realize like if Google doesn't want to say a, a story exists or a thought exists that they can choose to just not show it. They're under no obligation to give like results for anything. And so if, if there's certain things that they don't want you to hear or to know or to understand, they just won't populate the results. I, I promise I promise you it's true. If you don't believe me, come to my office. I'll, I'll give you a little demo. When, when we think about cancel culture and what's going on, I mean, the, these same companies that want to restrict speech and restrict like differing views and understandings, right now at this very moment, the leader of the Taliban can uh, do an Instagram post, but a previous president of the United States can't. Now, listen, if you guys know me, I'm not a huge fan of the previous president of the United States. I mean, he did some things that I like, but I am not like a, a juice drinking, like a huge supporter of the man. But there is a major problem in this country when the leader of the Taliban is able to get his voice out and a previous president of the United States can't. What is that? It's called cancel culture. Why do we do it? Why do we allow it? It's because of uh, the emotion of hatred. Gender identity. What causes us to think it's a good idea for men to be able to be women and for women to become men? The emotion that governs how we understand that is called sympathy and pity. I mean, if the person wants to be a girl, let him. If she wants to become a man, let her become a him. Who's it gonna hurt? What's wrong with it? You know, they're, they're hurting. And so now we allow children who aren't old enough to, to buy cigarettes, children who aren't old enough to drive, children who aren't even allowed old enough to sign themselves up for peewee soccer and baseball and whatever, like they can start a process and no one can tell them the no to change their identity. And we live in a day and age in which we don't know what singular and plural is anymore. I was literally reading an article within the last week or two, and it was talking out about a person, and the writer was referring to them as they. Is it just me, or is that just insane? But why do we have that disconnect where we don't even know the difference between singular or plural anymore? It's because we're looking at it through emotion, the poor person. How about, and this is my last one, human sexuality. Homosexuality, you know, it, what governs like us thinking that that's a good idea? Well, it's something called lust. And lust allows a lot of things to take place, not only just homosexuality, but all the, uh, the porn places that when you drive down the road and, and different things like that that just shouldn't be allowed. It's not good. It's not right. It's not good for society. It's not good for how we look at people and so forth. But, but out of lust, we, you know, that's an emotion. We, we allow it. God said of himself that because of their own lustful desires, I'm going to hand them over to them. 
you know, 15 years ago or whenever it was when the most liberal state in this country or one of the most liberal, California, actually voted against same-sex marriages, and we saw the court overturn that and force that upon this country. Starting there, we should have known that we're in trouble. Why? Because we're looking at it through emotion, through lust, rather than through truth, reality, and what God's Word says. In the end, when we allow emotions, whether those emotions be hate, pity, fear, lust, compassion, whatever, when we allow our emotions to govern how we see things, it will hold us, it will cause us to hold non truths as truths. I want to leave you with a passage from Scripture, James chapter 1, 22 to 24. Do not merely listen to the word. Here's a problem in today's day and age is we just listen to the, to the word. You know, people say, you know, Pastor, why you got to get so political? If you hear anything that I just said today is political, that's on you. There's nothing political about this. I don't, I don't even, like, subscribe so much to political parties. Yeah, is there one I vote with more than the other? Yeah, because they, they share in the most part views that I do. But many of them are starting to become corrupt and see things and be influenced by the society. There's nothing that I'm saying right now that is political. It's just truth. But what the problem is, is in churches, we just listen to God's word, but we don't ever do anything about it. We don't ever apply it to our lives. We don't actually live it out. James says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. If all you're doing is listening to God's word, you're just simply deceiving yourselves. You got to do what it says. For anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks into the face, looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he even looks like. What I'm asking you guys to do is don't forget what you look like. You're a children made in the image of the Almighty God. Bear his reflection, bear his truth, bear his reality, not the false truths that, that go on in the world today. Be a light to the world around us. Be an ambassador of who God is and of his truth. And let your truth be informed by wisdom in his word and not by emotion that will so oftentimes lead to non-truth. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we thank and praise you for your word today. As we, as we go through life, we can be um, prisoners to our emotions, and some of us in here more than others, but I just pray, gracious God, that you make us wise not only to salvation, but that you pour upon us the wisdom that comes only by your word, that we would hold true to those truths in our families that we would be a light to our families so that our kids and our grandkids might know what truth is. And where our families learn what truth is, that we would uh, burn brightly in, in, in truth for the world to see around us. Even if that puts us at risk for our jobs, if it puts us at risk for, um, for friends, even if that puts us at risk for ultimately imprisonment, that we would ultimately um, be reflectors of you for we are made in your image and called to bear your image. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.